My shame is taken away. My pain is healed in his name. I believe. I believe. I'll raise a banner. Because my Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. I know He rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame He's taken away. My pain is healed in his name. I believe, I believe. I'll raise a banner. Because my Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives. 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 He's alive. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. You lift my burdens. I'll rise with you. I'm dancing on this mountain top to see your kingdom come. My Redeemer lives. 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 Oh, 
to say. In Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Let's call upon the name of the Lord today. Let's bless his name. Down here at the front there are the prayer lists. There's some in the back. There's some on the sides in the lobbies. We encourage you to come find a, a spot to praise him, to pray. We had our first time last night of Prayer Force One, people gathering to pray. I trust if you weren't here, you were praying at your home or wherever you might be for the services today. Not just for the services, but for lives to be impacted for the kingdom of God. We want him to receive all the glory. So we encourage you in just a moment to enter in to continue to praise the Lord. The altar is always open for you to come and praise him down front or receive prayer. The brethren are going to be there to anoint with oil for, for needs that you have. We invite you to enter in. God wants to receive the praise of his people, not because he needs it, not because he needs it. It's good for us. It's good for us. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to praise his name forever. Father, we come in the name of Jesus today to bring praise and honor to you, to shout your glory, your presence in the house. And Father, everything that we brought into the house today we want to lay it at the feet of Jesus. If we came in with a testimony of joy, we want to lay it at the feet of Jesus and give you praise. If we came in with a need and a heavy heart, we want to lay that at your feet and allow you to touch the things that we lay at your feet today and transform our lives, impact people around about us for the glory of the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. 
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long blessed assurance all is at rest I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Looking above, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. In our lungs, so 
we pour out our praise to you only. Salvation, Salvation through, through repentance, repentance 
at the cross on which he died. Now hear my absolution, forgiveness for my sin.
as Christ was raised to life, now in Him, now in Him I live. I will rise, I will rise as Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now in Him, I live. I will rise, I will rise, as Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now in We gather to celebrate the reality of his resurrection, but that we have a part in it. Amen? How many of you are alive in Christ Jesus today? Your sins have been obliterated by the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, my goodness, it's time to have a shouting time in the church. Oh, we got to sing it again. I like it. We got to sing it again. We got to sing. I live. Christ lives in me. Amen. Let's shout it out, shall we? Give him some praise and worship. Hallelujah. I will rise. I will rise. Christ was raised to life, now in Him, now in Him I live, I will rise. It's therefore now I, will I no longer live, but Christ liveth in me. As Christ Hallelujah. was raised to life. Now in Him, oh, now. now in Him, I live. team, everybody helping out. Hallelujah. Be seated if you can. I'm going to stay standing. I forgot to mention a welcome to any guests that we have with us today. We counted a privilege and an honor. You selected to be here with us at Trinity today. 
In the back of the pew in front of you is a, a contact card. If you'd take that and fill it out, drop it in the offering plate, or hand it to one of the ushers or deacons at the close of the service. Uh, we just want to thank you for being with us. Also in the north and the south lobby, there's a basket there that has a free DVD for you just for coming and sharing with us today. Be sure and pick one up as you leave. It has some testimonies, some sharing about the ministries of the church, some of the things that are going on, and we just want to welcome each one that's here today. Could you give a round of applause to our guest today? In the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to be launching a series of messages today related to revival. How many of you think it might be a really good idea <laughs> to have a move of God? I don't want a move of man. We've seen so much of that. You, you can't program a move of God. But we're going to be talking about help, <laughs> a cry for revival. We need God's help, his intervention. We encourage you to be sure and, and read the bulletin and the things on the screen. And be sure and shut your phone off. That would be another thing. I'm hearing all kinds of phones ring. Uh, be sure and shut your phone off, if you would, please. We'd appreciate it. If not, if I hear it in the middle of service, I'm going to come back and answer it. And we'll just share with everybody. Bob Evans is having a special? Oh. Amen. Don't get so excited about that. We encourage you today to not leave early. Have you ever been to a ball game uh, or watched a ball game and it's really getting out of hand and the, and the fans start leaving before the ball game's over? Uh, we were at one ball game one time up at the Indians and, and it was really out of hand. I mean, they were getting pummeled by the other team. And, but I'd paid good money for those seats. I wasn't about to leave till it was over, even though we were getting belted by this other team. And people, the stands began to clear. And they missed the greatest comeback in the history of baseball. They were down by 26 runs. And they started coming back and coming back. And people stopped leaving. But those that left, they missed the last two innings, and they had to listen in their car to the cheers erupting because the Indians came back and won it. Yeah, they did. They did. I was there. I saw it. I watched it. I cheered myself hoarse. I was sad that it was a Saturday, and I didn't have a voice to preach the next day. But, boy, what a game. I said all that to say, that don't leave early today. Don't leave early. There's two very important things at the conclusion of the service. The first important thing is the altar call. I can guarantee you there's absolutely nothing so important you need to leave before you give an opportunity for God's Holy Spirit to deal with your heart. And then after the altar service, we're going to be sharing in remembrance of his great sacrifice for us at the communion table. We encourage you, don't leave. Don't leave until you've experienced a time at the altar and a time of remembering his sacrifice for you. You think Jesus might deserve your attention for what he did? Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the ushers to come at this time. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask Brother Chauncey to come up. He's going to pray over the, the offering. Many of you missed it, but uh, had a great message Chauncey did last Sunday night and uh, had a great word from the Lord. And we're inviting him to come and lead in prayer over the offering today. And then Sherm's going to sing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for 
these blessings that you pour out on us so abundantly, Lord. But I pray that you will help us to remember that nothing is ours. Everything belongs to you. You have simply made us stewards of that which you have blessed us with. So as freely as we have received these blessings, Lord, let us also freely give for your purpose, for your glory, for the purpose of your kingdom. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. going to have to use this mic. Here you go. The wired mic, keyboard mic. This thing died on me. At least you know what the song is now. At least you didn't die on me. That day's coming. Number two. We'll give you this. Take it up and show it to somebody. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. We want to be talking for the next several weeks leading up to our Impact Sunday. I trust that you are advertising, inviting, cajoling, whatever you have to do to get people out 
as we're going to be sharing on a Sunday morning the drama John the Revelator. How many of you believe we just might be able to see the end times from where we're sitting right now? It's a message for this day and this age, for the church and for the world. And we encourage you to be missionaries and evangelists and take some of the flyers or some at the north and south uh, lobbies. We encourage you to take and invite people. and Don't just post it, invite people uh, to come to that. But we want to look at revival. We've entitled these series of messages, Help the Cry for Revival. We used to have in Maslin, Ohio, a cry room in the back of the sanctuary. It was separated by what was supposed to be soundproof glass. But it wasn't. And you could see the little babies back there being paced back and forth, crying. And out in the congregation, you could see the mothers recognizing the cry. And when the cries got so intense, they got up and went back and cared for their child. We can say we want revival, but until we have a heart cry to God for revival, why should he move? If we're not serious, why should he move? I invite you to stand with me in honor and respect for the reading of God's word in Psalm 74. Psalm 74. Maybe you felt like this as the psalmist wrote, O God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old. Amen. The tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed. The Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. And now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long, O oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand, take it out of your bosom and destroy them? For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. We're going to stop there today. Father, bless your word as we embark on a study of the need for revival. Your sanctuaries have been destroyed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and keep your Bibles open to this portion of God's Word. Many years ago, I received a phone call in the early part of the morning before I generally would uh, be up. You always know it's fun when you get a call from the police. Reverend Keene? Huh? Yes, yes. There's been a break-in at your church. This 
one we were pastoring over at Eastgate in Reynoldsburg. But we got him. Well, all right, that's, that's efficient. Could you come over and identify some of the things that were stolen? So I got up and went over to Tucson Road and went in and there was a smell of smoke. That's not a good sign. I went in and in the back of the, the police car we saw a, a, a guy hiding his face from us and slinking down. This fellow had broken into the church and he had stolen a number of things. He had stolen our keyboard from the platform, electronic keyboard. Those are a little pricey. Some microphones and other amplifying equipment. He broke the door of my office and went in and for some reason he picked up some Bibles and some other books that I had on my desk that happened to have my name in them. Then he went into the secretary's office and he pried open filing cabinets and took the petty cash that he found. And then he took a lot of the items that he found around the church and he set a trash can up in the middle of the fellowship hall and set it afire. <clears throat> Then he took off, <clears throat> not a, a brilliant rocket science kind of uh, thief. He had no transportation with him. <laughs> and the, the police noted it's an unusual sight at four in the morning to see someone taking their keyboard for a walk. And they pulled up, he dropped it and started running. They caught him. Not only he wasn't bright, he was not fleet of foot either. <laughs> Brought him back. They looked inside, saw my name and number and everything on the, the, some of the books that he's taken. They came back and they found that they couldn't explain it. I have an explanation. The fire that he had set in the trash can that really could have burned the place down, extinguished itself. You feel violated when something's been stolen from your church. When someone came in and just smacked you in the face, so to speak, and said, I don't care, I'm going to steal this, and I'm going to take it for my own. I need to tell you the rest of the story, because it's kind of a unique story. They arrested him, and I was notified that the trial was in such and such a date, so I made it a point to be there with our attorney, and uh, while we were there, he didn't show up for the hearing because he was back at the church robbing it again. <laughs> he knew where we'd be. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, we finally got a court hearing and he was guaranteed his presence because he was locked up. And the the judge was just kind of him hawing around like, well, what's the big deal, you know? And he said, well, I think what we'll, he's already served some time, so, so what we're going to do is we're just going to let him off with time served. And I, I raised my hand, and my attorney says, don't do that. He doesn't like, don't do that. And, but I did anyway. I, I was just so overwhelmed by it. And he says, what? And I said, well... You're telling him that he's got time served. We know for a fact, he says, now don't bring into something, into the court, something that hasn't been proven. I said, okay, just between me and you, judge, he broke in again and they caught him. Okay. 
could you give him a further instruction? Judge says, what do you want me to do? Tell him not to be around any place or around your church? No. I said, he can come any time during regular service time. Matter of fact, I wish you'd make it a sentence. Because he obviously needs something that we have. And he granted my petition. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary, it says in Psalm 74, 3. Folks, revival does not start with services. It starts when the church recognizes we need revival. We need a move of God. The status quo is not acceptable to us. The condition that we find ourselves in is summed up in this portion of Scripture. For you see, many people are saying, God has forsaken America and the churches of America. Nothing could be further from the truth. The opposite is the truth. America and the churches have forsaken God. It says he has damaged every, the enemy has damaged the, everything in the sanctuary. Now, we know who our enemy is, don't we? Our enemy is not a person, it's somebody who disrupts and destroys. Satan, the evil one, is alive and well and messing with us all the time. And it's no small wonder that he's taken on the church, the sanctuary, to try to destroy what can happen here that can impact the world that he's leading around by the nose. You see, Satan is wise enough to realize that all the things that are being done out in the world, all the sin, all the terror, all of the immorality cannot be changed by rule of law or by the guns of men. Something's got to start in the church of Almighty God. Something's got to happen in the heart of God's people. We've got to get fed up with the status quo and begin, oh God, we need you to come. We need you to help us. Help! A cry for revival. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Now what was in the sanctuary of, of the time the psalmist was writing? The tabernacle. When you walk into the, the gates of the, and the courtyard, it was a place of sacrifice called the brazen altar. You couldn't go any further until you allowed a sacrifice of blood to be made. A lamb without spot and without blemish. The blood shed to cover for a season the sins of the people. But I declare to you that Satan has destroyed that aspect in many places. The cross of Jesus Christ was the wooden altar that Jesus was nailed to. But some people say, don't talk about the cross anymore. Don't talk about his suffering. Don't talk about the stripes upon his back from the Roman whip. Don't talk about the crown of thorns. Don't talk about the fact that his hands and his feet were impaled upon that cross. And that he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do that he laid down his head and said, It is finished, the sacrifice for sins of all time. That if we confess our sins, he is then faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the enemy has come to the sanctuary and stolen that truth that you must be born again. It's not enough to be a member of a church. It's not enough 
to do good deeds. And the false teaching that is out there today, they say, yes, Jesus did die for the sins of the world. And by that, it's already done. You don't need to personally apply for it to be done to you. You're covered. Through no act of your will, not confessing your sin, just the fact that Jesus did it, it's done, well then why the rest of the New Testament? Why did Jesus say you, you must be born again if it's going to be handed to you? No, he paid the price. But we've got a sign on the dotted line that we receive his act of sacrifice for us. That we can be conformed to the image of God's Son. That we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but you he is made alive as you've confessed him unto the Father. They've stolen the, the sacrifice out of the sanctuary. They want to make it pristine and beautiful. We've been robbed. We've been robbed by the enemy of the place that the cross needs to occupy in every one of our lives. Wasn't it Jesus who said, if you would follow after me, deny yourself and find a comfortable way to follow me. No, take up the cross. If there's not a cross in your life of his sacrifice and your service, you've been robbed. You go from the brazen altar and you look at the, the labor which was there for the cleansing of the hands and the feet and to, to cleanse the face. And it's been stolen, my friends. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Some people would have us believe that once you're saved, you don't need any further cleansing. Well, yes, I have it on my wall that I was saved. I was born again, bless God, on December whatever, whatever, in the year ought six, you know. And they use that as saying, well, I'm, I'm good to go. Jesus tells us we need to be continually washed in the water of the word and cleansed. Jesus said, you are cleansed clean through the word which I have spoken to you. It doesn't stop when we're saved, folks. We, how many of you realize just getting a bath when you were 12 does not mean that you don't need to take a bath the rest of your life. We know who you are. If you, we know who you are, if you believe that. Well, I was cleaned up at an altar years ago. Folks, the stink can attach itself to you again. And we need to keep our repentance flowing. It doesn't mean that he withholds his salvation but there's a point at which we become so filthy we cannot be a witness to our world because we smell and act and behave and talk just like them. Satan, the enemy, has tried to rob the cleansing nature of the Word of God from our churches, from our believers, our, believers, our gatherings together. So it's just become an informational time. Well, I'm going to amaze and dazzle you with how much I know about the Scripture. That's not what it's about, folks. It's to impact our lives. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. When you step inside the tabernacle of old, on the right-hand side was the table of showbread, the bread of presence, and it was a a bread that was baked specifically for the priesthood and to offer up to God. It's a symbol that Jesus is the bread of life. 
It's that same showbread that David, the psalmist, when he was running in fear for his life, came and his men were fed by the bread of presence, even though the enemy was trying to destroy them. Well, what has the enemy stolen from the bread of life in the sanctuary? You see, the word of God has been stolen. It's been hijacked. We find scripture portions on every major monument in Washington, D.C. Upon the face of the Capitol and inside the rotunda. It used to be a site where former presidents back in the early days held church services. The word of God has been emblazoned upon the Capitol, but laws have been passed which spit in the face of the God who wrote the word. The word of God is chiseled on the walls of the Supreme Court, but they revile the Lord who wrote it by their decisions. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. He's taken the word of God and made it the one thing you can't rely upon and share. You can have Sharia law, you can have all kinds of other cases pled, but the word of God, the law of God has been removed. And our sanctuary is the poorer for it. What else was in the sanctuary of old? Scripture says the enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. You find that there was the altar of incense, the centermost part up against the veil. It speaks of prayer and praise. How has this been damaged? Worshiping God, true worshiping of God has been replaced by America's Got Talent. We're putting on a show, a pretext. It's not about praise to man, it's about praise to God. One pastor stated that in order to really have the true presence of God return to our sanctuaries, we've got to get We've got to rid our sanctuary of what distracts us from him. Prayer has become a diminished priority in many churches, many individuals' lives, because the church is only as strong as the ones who are of that flock. Praise priority. Well, I have to be really pumped up to praise God. Then it's not really praise then, is it? What else was in the old sanctuary? The golden candlestick filled with the holy oil to give light. The only source of light in the sanctuary. The enemy has damaged our reverence and our seeking of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You see, if we can get along as a church without the Holy Spirit, why should the Lord baptize us in it? Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we're not thirsty, if we're not hungry for the Spirit of the Lord, in our gatherings, but also in our lives. Why should the Lord pour out a fresh endowment of power? Many places have shoved the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the operation of the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, shoved it off to side rooms and broom closets. It destroyed the sanctuary. We need a strong, deep desire for the Spirit of Almighty God to come in convicting power, in Holy Ghost anointing, 
in anointing for healings and deliverance, empowerment, in service. But we've got to want it. For the Holy Spirit to move in us so that we can impact the darkened world. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Oh, pastor, you got it wrong because there was something else in the, in the sanctuary of old. There was the Holy of Holies, the Kadesh, the, Kadesh, the, the place where the, the presence of God dwelt and the Ark of the Covenant would beat and, and covered with gold and then a mercy seat of pure gold with fashioned Ark angels looking over the cherubs, looking over the transaction of the blood sacrifice. But you know what? If you look behind the curtain, somebody has changed out the God of the Bible for the God of this time and this world. I was reading a story from the Old Testament you can learn a lot from the Old Testament, you know. Back in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, King Solomon has died, and his son has assumed the throne. You remember Solomon was supposed to be wise? Not so much his son. Rehoboam was now king. And Rehoboam had done a number of really stupid things by anybody's standards. The people came to him and said, O King Rehoboam, you know, your father, because of building the temple and everything, had really put a load, a heavy load upon us. Could you lighten the load a bit, please? Could you, could you lighten the load? And Rehoboam uh, looked over to his advisors, and his advisors said, that's good advice. That's, that's good stuff. Because the people are really, they've been for a number of years, they've been under a, and Rehoboam says, well, I'll take it under advisement. Then he called everybody together and he said, I, I've, I've come up with a plan that, you see, y'all thought my, my father Solomon was really strong, but you know, he's like my little finger compared to me. I'm going to triple the tax. And I'm going to require more of slave labor. And it resulted in a rebellion against the northern tribes from the southern tribes. During that period of time, when he went off in his own arrogance, the king of, of Egypt came along, and it was a mighty kingdom at that time, and Israel was not. And he walked right in with his guards and he pillaged the temple of all of its gold. He went in and pried the gold off the walls. He took the gold around from the, from the ark. He took all of the things. That, there was even the guards had shields of solid gold that they stood in, in attention. And he took every last one of them. The people of Israel didn't realize what was going on. But they had been robbed. Their sanctuary had been robbed of the pure gold that was there. Now, Rehoboam, he didn't want anybody to know what a big foul up he was. So he called in the artisans and they fashioned out of brass cheaper imitations. So they're standing at attention, polished brass that reflected the light, but it's not gold. And the gold of the sanctuary, it's not there. It looks the same. It's bright and shiny as the other, but it's not real. See, folks, we need to realize that the enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary and replaced it sometimes with something that appears the same but is not the God of the Bible. 
or his ways. The God of the Bible has been replaced by the God of this world in this time. Hear what the word of the Lord says in Jeremiah 10, beginning with verse 8. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver's beaten into plates. It's brought from Tarshish, the gold from Uphaz, the work of the craftsmen of the hands of the metalsmiths, blue and purple are their clothing. They all are the work of skillful men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the everlasting King. All his wrath, the earth will tremble and nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. A cheap imitation of God. A man-made style of God. Isaiah 45 talks about it. In verse 20, Assemble yourselves and come draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Deuteronomy 5, You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone. You do not know the God who holds your breath in your hands and owns all your ways. You have not glorified. To replace the God of the Bible, the God of the living word, with a man-made stylized deity won't work. It won't cut it. The enemy has stolen the true nature of God from the sanctuary. Brass for gold. The true God says the wages of sin is death. But the new God says, that's a little harsh. I'm a God of love, not of judgment. The true God says, repent and stop sinning. The new God says, don't be so judgmental. Learn to adapt. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. Lord, we really need your help. We really need a revival of your Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church. It's not enough just to meet together a couple times a week and to sing songs church is not here for show, it's for impact. It's to reach a lost and a dying world. Cry for revival for the God of the Bible to show up and do these things. Oh, it's scary because he doesn't change and the thing he didn't like before, he still does it. The things that he didn't tolerate before, he by the way, still does it. Now we've changed our opinions on it, perhaps, and society has, has said that's outmoded, that we, we can't do that, it's not politically correct. You can't say that. Somebody might be going to hell. You can just let them go there and not do a thing to stop them. Psalm 74 and verse 2 says, Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance, which you have redeemed. This Mount Zion where you have dwelt, lift up your feet to the perpetual desolation. Time after time after time, in the word of God, when God's people, the children of Israel, had drifted away and turned away from their God, 
God allowed a season to develop where it seemed like everything was gone. Until the people began to cry, Oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the year. It doesn't just take one person saying it. There has to be a heartbeat of a church to desire the move of God. To desire, how many of you think it would be really cool to impact our world around us here at Trinity? It's not about being cool. It's about being righteous. And we've got a hunger and thirst for it. We've got to seek the Lord. I, I don't want to pastor a church that's just hanging on. I want to pastor a church that's pushing on. And it's going against the very gates of hell. I love that statement of Jesus. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We've talked about it many times before, but it strikes me that the gates of hell, the very power position of the evil in our world is not coming against the church. The church is coming against the walls. The church is, the gates of hell are not coming against us, but the Christian, the church of Jesus Christ is out beaten on the doors of the gates of hell and saying, we want to set people free. We want lives to be transformed. We want souls to be saved. We want healings to be affected. We want to see a move of Almighty God kicking down the doors of the gates of hell not just patiently waiting for them to fall on their own. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. But the good news is, the really good news is, God hears the cry of his people. God hears the cry. And when we get serious with God, God, will get serious with us. I'm believing for an unparalleled move of God on this southwest corner of the city of Columbus. Well, brother, I remember back then. I remember over there. I don't care. You can't live in that. Oh, it can bless you from time to time. Remember when? The, yeah, that's great. But you know what? I'd rather than remember what used to happen is to see what God can do today. You all know the feeling? You used to feel stronger than you do today. Some of you are getting some age on you. And you remember back what you used to be able to do, and you just can't do it anymore. And something in our warped thinking thinks that God is like. Poor old God, look what he used to be. He always did it through vessels that were willing to believe that he could do it. So as we launch into this time of crying, help, we will cry for revival from the Lord. It's a heart cry that needs to start within each one of us. Not just a couple, not just two or three. And I believe that when the decibel level rises sufficient, when we're, you parents all know, when your kids were hurt, you heard them cry. How many of you have done this? Uh, they just whine and they're just, you know, uncomfortable. And they're growing a new tooth in or something, you know. They, they weren't really... But you knew when they cried and they meant business. And you got out of your seat and you went to help them. Why should God answer the whimper of the church when he's waiting for the cry from the church? Revive us, O oh God. Start the work 
in my life, in my church. I'm going to ask you with every head bowed and every eye closed to stand to your feet. A song of invitation will be beginning. We need to I need you more. You. Invite you more to this than yesterday, to I need you more. I invite you. We're going to pray, and then I invite more you to leave this God to find a place to pray. I need you more. You say, yes, I, I need revival in my own heart. Ever before, I need you, Lord. You're coming and you're saying, I, I, need, I need a touch you more. of God. I become I complacent. I'm just whimpering. God, we need help. I've not begun to cry to the Lord. I've allowed things to be stolen from me. And I want the Lord Almighty God to bring it back. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. I need you, Lord. I need you. Restore honor for who you are. Restore a reverence for your holiness. Not our man-made God, but a Bible-defined God. Father, we pray today that the cry of revival would go up and would find you here at Pittsburgh. I need you more for God in your life. I'm going to step aside. I need you more. In my heart, I believe the altar ought to be filled today. You would breathe. I need you more. That's just me. The cry. I need you more. The cry for revival. The heart cry. See God move in our day and time. Prayer and praise returning to its position, rightful position. Worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. A burden for the lost. A burden for a sin-cursed world. Help. Cry for revival. More yesterday, I need you more. Oh, more than Mighty God. Mighty God.